would uh, definitely admit that this uh, series in Ecclesiastes maybe is frustrating at times when you say the author Koheleth is frustrated in the world, frustrated with how short everything seems to fall of what its promises would be. Uh, promises for human justice fall short. The promises for wealth and success fall short. Promises even for wisdom seems to fall short again and again and not meet its demands of giving us meaning and purpose. How do we survive? How do we move on? Again and again we see this refrain to eat and drink, enjoy the good things of this world. It seems to be such a flippant response at times. What place do we have in this world, especially in our passage today, as, we, as it shows there are people over us. There are people who rule over us. So how do we get through this life? How do we move through this life where it's so hard to find meaning, so hard to find purpose? What place does obedience have in finding mer, uh, meaning and purpose? Let's see what Koheleth tells us here in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, starting in verse 2. The preacher Koheleth says, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything. Although man's trouble lies heavy on him, for he does not know what is to be. For who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying to my heart to all that is done under the sun. When man had power over man to his hurt, then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. The heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well for the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on the earth that the right, there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to deeds of the righteous. I said this also is vanity. And I commend joy. For man has nothing better under the sun but eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. This is the word of the Lord. On New Year's Eve, Emma's uh, family, when we gather together, have a bit of a tradition. And one of them is uh, playing a game called Wise and Otherwise. It is a game of proverbs and axioms and wise sayings that are spoken in many cultures and many languages throughout the world. The challenge of the game, though, is you're only given half, the first half of the proverb over the wise saying. And everyone has to go around and try to guess what the rest of the proverb is. And only one slip of paper in there actually has the right answer. So you can imagine the hilarious kind of situations that goes, you're trying to figure out, okay, what is the wise saying here? Pulling up some wise sayings even I, I found online, line, if you can't live long, the other half of this Italian saying is, live deep. What does live deep mean if you can't live long? I guess that's up for you to figure out. A Japanese proverb, fall seven times, get up eight. So I guess the trying to continue to figure out the math there of that one. Maybe help me explain that one. My favorite proverb that I recently found, though, is speak the truth from Slovenia. Speak the truth, but leave immediately after. 
Jeff, your haircut looks terrible. I'm gone. Speak the truth, but leave immediately after. That one is of the favorite I, you know, I found, especially because it, it has this kind of um, self-preservation behind it. I think a lot of Proverbs are truly about that in some ways. The Italian proverb, you can't live long, live deep, realizes that you can only preserve yourself for so long, so as you try to preserve yourself as best you can, make the most of it. The Japanese one, fall seven times, get up eight. This a proverb of you will fall. You will experience failure, but be resilient. Continue to rise up. The Slovenian one seems to speak of, you know, the truth can bring harm to you. What are you to do when that harm comes? You know, in, in other passages in, in chapter 7, the passage last week, we kind of skipped over some of the Proverbs. Uh, he has a, a list of Proverbs there. And this passage isn't so much a list of Proverbs, but just um, a wise way of life in the beginning. And I think there are some kind of parallel things, parallel ideas that Kawalath is trying to think through. How do we live through this life? I want to offer kind of three ideas that he offers here. Each one of these points will have a correction to it, that is, Koalath examines it. So there's a correction to be made here. The first one is, as he talks about the king, that following powerful people will preserve you. If you follow and obey the powerful people, you will be preserved. It's the first thing he analyzes. We'll see the correction made to that one. Next one is crime never pays. This one is actually kind of a proverb that we have. Crime never pays. Evil and wickedness never pays off. There's always retribution. Is that what he sees in his life? And the last one uh, adapted from uh, the Bob Marley lyric, don't worry, be happy. It seems to be the best thing that he seems to have at the end, right? Just don't worry, just be happy, find joy. I commend joy in all things. What does he mean when he says that? Let's look first at this, uh, these first uh, about nine verses or so, two, or, uh, eight really, two to nine, of how he talks about the king. Submission to the king. Follow the king's command because of God's oath to him. Don't be hasty to leave his presence. Don't stand in for an evil cause. Do whatever he pleases. Just follow the king. That's what he's there for. He's there to be obeyed. And there are a few reasons Coel gives for this, right? He says about God's oath to him. Essentially, the reasoning here is, well, God put the king there. God put the king in place. And that is a similar kind of argument we feel find elsewhere in Scripture of why should we submit to authorities. And the first one is that God put them there. There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, Paul says in Romans 13. He also says in the final part, is that rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Essentially, what Paul is saying, what Koalith is saying, God put these people there over you, and disobeying them brings trouble, doesn't it? They're not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. So respect him, he says. Koalith says, don't be hasty to leave their presence. If you were to be called to an audience of the king, and you showed up and listened to a few of his words and then turned your back on them. Incredibly disrespectful. To turn your back quickly on the emperor, the ruler, the king, the, the one in authority over you. To be hasty to get out there as if, as if to say, I got better things going on than standing around talking with you. The insult would, would be a, such a great disrespect and invites calamity upon you. So essentially... That argument is actually quite, um, I suppose, uh, uh, pragmatic, isn't it? The argument is, you know, listen to the king's orders. Paul, similar as well. They're not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Part of the advice here is that rebellion is bad for your health. <laughs> Disobedience to human authorities can invite some dangers to your health. It's a, it seems to be a very pragmatic way of looking at things. But we know that's not the only way to look at authority, look at obedience. Because will we escape all goodness if we just completely obey? Well, we see later in this passage, that doesn't seem to be the case. There are people who do the righteous thing and yet are treated as if they did the wicked thing. There are people who get the punishment for wickedness even though they're fully 
righteous. Fully just trying to be preserved by the whims and the pleasures of powerful people will not keep you alive, will not give you good and easy life itself. Why does that seem to be the case? Yes, it, seems, it says that the, the king is sovereign here. The king has power. The king has authority. But does the king have ultimate power to preserve you? Can just by being a good, obedient subject to the king preserve your health forever? No. And you know why? It is because our authorities don't have ultimate control and power over everything. That there is a time set for the right and the just cause. And God has put the authorities there to pursue justice. But even when they don't, even when they completely fail to execute justice well, do not worry. There is a time set for that. And it is not ultimately in the ruler's power. There is a time set for everything in verse 6, he says. Yes, fear the retribution that disobedience brings. Don't imagine that they are just as powerful as the Lord. For after all, it says, no, ma no man, no man, no king, no emperor, no ruler has the power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. Nor, or there is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. There are kind of these, all these different areas that he says, no, there's no power, no ability to save you there. Powerful people do not have power to keep your spirit, to retain your soul on earth. It is God's power. You cannot catch or retain the soul, the wind itself of someone. You cannot keep your soul in your own body, even by your own strength. Because you yourself, as he says, do not choose the day of death. The day of your own death, when your soul finally, your spirit is released from its body, is not controlled by yourself and it's not controlled by those other human rulers. They're finite. You are finite in that. In the same way, this is kind of image of the battlefield he brings out. There's no release, early release from the battlefield. No early discharge. Once the battle, battle has begun, you can't just turn your back and desert. You're able to leave before the battle, but once it has begun, you're engaged. Because to turn your back in the throng of that chaos and melee, you cannot disengage once the battle has begun. And so that last part he says is all the things that we're considering. Do we live in obedience? disobedience. How are we to live? Wickedness itself is powerless to save us. That ultimately, we're, not, no, we're no longer talking about the wickedness of obeying or disobeying the rulers and authorities, but the ultimate one we are to serve is the King of Kings, Jesus himself. And that our wickedness cannot find its way out. Eventually, the wicked will not escape by their wickedness, he says. Think of someone who just pathologically lies, continues in lies and deceit. They can survive for a while. They can even rise to powerful authority by lies. But eventually the constant lies and stories and fibs that you tell will catch up to you. You see in the news things like Congressman George Santos, who's in a lot of hot water for all the made-up things he said on his campaign trail. Now he's investigated for that. His lies were able to help get him to a place of power, right? But will that preserve? Lies cannot preserve us. In the end, the truth does win out. And so we are corrected here that no human power lasts forever. No human power can control things to keep us in our powers forever. It is ultimately divine and holy power that we're supposed to submit to and obey. That in the end, yes, the truth wins out. As we're told, right? Crime doesn't pay, right? Does it? Crime never pays? Well, it seems. It seems. Koalth is a little worried because it seems that what he has seen in the world, the vanity he's seen in the world, that sometimes criminals get off pretty okay. That they do have a pretty good go of it in life. That even in their death, they still get eulogized. They still get praised in the city, it says. I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place. They were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. 
He was talking about at their funerals, their burials, that they are still praised even then. They're praised as they executed these wicked deeds in their lives. And now, as they're laid to rest, people are still remarking and praising them. Everyone deserves a funeral, right? Even the most wicked deserves burial and funerals, right? Why would someone be so against the eulogy even of a wicked person? I think we have to think about what kind of wicked person we're talking about. I actually recently heard this sentiment in somewhat of a shocking way, too. Recently, the uh, conclusion of the trial for the shooter at the uh, Parkland, Florida school shooting in 2018 was sentenced and received a life sentence, not a death, death penalty, for one of the worst school shootings in history. But what is always incredibly impactful, powerful, memorable at these trials of wicked people, of criminals, are the victim statements or families of the victim statements. Now, in the church, we often will highlight, and I think it's right to do so, the ones where victims are, are pleading for the person to repent and preaching the gospel for them. I think that's a beautiful thing to see. But I want to bring your attention to that is not what everyone always thinks. The grandfather of one of the victims of this shooting, uh, the victim of Alyssa Aladef, her, grand, um, Aladef, her grandfather spoke as a victim statement, wouldn't even use the person's name, just called them Parkland murderer and said, quote, there's going to come a day where you're going to die. When you die, it is my fondest hope that they take you and burn you and take your ashes and throw them in the garbage dump. You know why? Because garbage to garbage, end quote. I admit those words of judgment kind of shock, are very shocking to hear, right? Disturbing, right? They're tough to hear, that kind of anger. Especially in church where we preach forgiveness and redemption. And to hear someone refer to another human being as garbage, yes, is quite strong. But I want you to emotionally connect with that person who's lost someone, who this grandfather is, who's had someone's heart torn out because of man's inhumanity to man. When someone does something horrific like that, murdering others, do you say they deserve a eulogy of the good things said about them as they are put in the grave without any repentance, without any desire for repentance? You can understand, perhaps, that feeling of that grandfather would feel. It's the feeling that Koala has as well. Why do these wicked people still get eulogized, still get praised? Does crime never pay? Do we really say what crime brings? tough, isn't it? When they are still might receive some honor. What are we to think about that? How do we reckon the fact of the incompleteness it feels? The inhumanity that we do to one another. As he says, man had power over man to his hurt. How do we live in a world where that happens? And Koloth realizes that just as in the case of the murderer at Parkland, his justice is delayed. Is a life sentence. That is justice in itself. But his accounting to his maker for that wickedness will come at a later date. There's a time set for that. But it's not now. It's not right now today. And so, Koloth realizes that sometimes justice is on a delayed time. We said before that obeying authority is good because rebellion brings consequences, right? But sometimes those qualities consequences don't seem to come quickly enough. That we'll do as much evil as we can before those consequences can arrive. What is the, the picture here? It says, he says, the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily. It's time for, for trial, for a stay of sentencing. And because of that, the heart of the children of man, that is all of us, is fully set to do evil. What sentence is he talking about? We're no longer talking about the justice system and human courts. We're talking about the accounting that we have at the final judgment. What sentence will we receive for our wickedness and evil? I think we think about those end times so far away that so often we may be like that child you see at the grocery store or at the playground 
is running away from their mother, and the mother is counting to five. But you know, and the kid knows, the mother's never actually going to go to five because she's counting one, two, two and a tenth. Two, two, and a quarter, two and a quarter, two and three quarters, two and a half. Okay, she just go back? Okay, she went back. Yeah, she did. You know they're never going to get to five. And so what does the kid do? The kid continues to, you know, push the limits. How far can I get? How far away can I get with this? How often have you or I felt that way? Okay, well, so no one knows or no one has found out yet what I'm doing or what I'm thinking, what I've said. So I can just do a little bit more. The consequences haven't come to me yet. It's only between me and myself. No one knows the, the justice, the sentence upon me isn't here yet. So let me continue to push things along. That is what our hearts will do. Fully set to see how far we can push things. The frustration that Kowaleth talks about, but the wicked seems to be in a very specific, grand, grand example. But he also says that all of our hearts are set to do evil, set to get as much wickedness as we can in before we get to the last day, and maybe we can then make up for all of it with some good deeds. He's frustrated by this. Crime never pays, right? Well, we, some of us, I, I will agree, probably can get by with some of our wickedness and get the enjoyments we can out of it. The pleasures that little bits of wickedness and sin get us. Happiness, the joy of keeping a little money back for ourselves, of per pursuing the pleasures that this world offers outside of the bounds of biblical marriage. I say, well, that's, that gives me a little bit of goodness now and no one's going to know. The ways of twisting truth, of, of putting others down to make yourself feel a little bit better. Well, no one really knows the effect that that has, so I can continue on that. Justice seems to be delayed, and so our hearts are continued on evil. But the other frustration that Koalath has here is that not only does justice seem to be delayed, that justice seems so backwards at times that the wicked and the evil often seem to escape justice, that the righteous people seem to receive punishments as if they were wicked, and the wicked people seem to get the good deeds of the righteous. Sometimes people can make the smallest traffic violation and end up killed by police. How quickly things can escalate. Some people, though, outright bribe the police so they can continue their illegal activity and live a long, comfortable, and wealthy life. How backwards our world seems to be. Can we find any rest in the, the hands of our kings and presidents and parliaments and laws? We may fear them for what they bring, but also frustrated at their inconsistency of the justice and injustice they bring. Crime never pays, right? Well, I think we should also realize that crime may pay. Wickedness may pay off in the short term. But there is an eternal cost. There is a time set by our God for our, all our wickedness. So what are we to do about that? Just be happy for the present? Just enjoy what time we have? If, if the justice seems to be delayed, then do we just enjoy things for now? Koath does say, I commend joy. But what he is saying first is a rare moment, almost out of character for him of confidence, of clarity, of surety, of certainty. He says in verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know it will be well with those who fear God. Yet I know it will be well. They fear before him. You realize this Kohalath guy has often said, I've seen this, it's vanity, I've seen this, it's vanity. Who can say, who knows, what can we do? But all of a sudden now he says, I know, it will be well. For those who fear the Lord. Here is a rare moment of confidence in the mouth of this very cynical person, right? In a book where meaning and purpose seem to elude his grasp, here he seems to know what it means to fear the Lord. That fear brings meaning. 
We've been searching for meaning this whole time, and here it is buried again in these verses. Yet I know it will be well for those who fear the Lord, that it will not be well with the wicked, neither will he prolong his days like a shadow. You know, at the end of your life, at the end of the day, the shadows get longer and longer. In the same way, the wicked might think by their wicked deeds that they'll lengthen their life at the end, like the shadows at the end. No, not so. It's not so. Wickedness cannot add a day to your life. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? It doesn't mean the constant shivering and trembling and falling prostrate and being terrified of what God will do. Let's talk about justice. Let's talk about accounting for our wickedness. Does that fill you with fear? What kind of fear should we have? I invite you to come to the presence of the King. Come to the presence of the King and do not leave hastily. But here we are in worship before the King, in his presence, at his table this morning. And what does he say to us? Knowing that this King Jesus is the King Maker, the one who puts kings on their thrones and presidents in their offices. Jesus, the King of all kings, is not a temperamental king who in the throne room we mentioned before, who is, ter- who is wrathful anytime someone turns around and is hasty to leave. No, this king is actually a king who delays justice to allow time for repentance. He allows time and a place for us to come and repent. Our king delays justice, not so his wicked friends can continue in their wickedness, but he executes this backwards justice. He, he doesn't, he's not the king who executes backwards justice of punishing the righteous and eulogizing the wicked. No, this king is a king who himself left his throne, not in haste, but left his throne in understanding and came to earth to live a righteous life, to receive the punishment of our wickedness, of your wickedness. He received the deeds that you and I have done. He didn't unjustly give the righteous people the punishment deserved for the wicked, but he in mercy and of his own will took on our punishment to give us grace so that we might repent, turn to him in fear and in faith. He rose again in three days to go back up and sit again on his throne. That is what our king has done. In his righteousness, lived a righteous life and died the death that we deserved so that justice would be dealt speedily. The justice for my sin was speedily dealt on the cross and punished on the cross. There is something that has happened to my wickedness and it was placed on the cross is that I fear and have faith in the Lord. Will you do the same today? Will you turn and see that that king of kings came down from his throne so that you could dwell forever, never departing from his throne room by his grace? Your shadow is lengthened, not on this earthly plane, but your shadow and your life is forever in his eternal throne room, in his eternal kingdom living in the light of the Son of God. And so, because of that good news, that there is hope, that justice has been dealt at the cross, and that there is freedom, as you put your faith in the Lord, Jesus Christ, and what he has done at the cross, to remove from you all the wickedness and deal all the punishment and justice it deserved. What is there for you in your life? What promise is there for you? But, Joy, as he reigns over all. The gift you get for fearing him is joy. It is a gift that God has given. Commend joy, for we have nothing better under the sun but eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go well with us in our toil, the days of our lives that God has given us under the sun. And We often might at times separate the words joy and happiness, right? And here, they're they're a little bit blended. We often think about joy as this eternal peace, pure happiness, uh, and happiness is just this fleeting momentary pain, or vain things and material things. But the happiness we're talking about here, 
has a root, has a source. The happiness that we have is the pleasure in what God's gifts are. It's rooted in what Jesus has done. That our joy and our happiness in the material things of this world are because they are just shadows of a greater thing. That we are right to take pleasure in the earthly beautiful things of today. Great food and drink and good day's work and good toil. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to be happy with the material world. Just get the priority light right. Get the priority of the material world correct. Our happiness and joy in the material world flows from our confidence that all will be well because we fear God. How do we know that things are going to be well? Because God has shown us to us that the cross of Christ, that though that justice is finished, it is finished, he said. So these material, temporary things are just shadows of greater promise and of greater reality. Augustine tells us that God is making us yearn for another kind of life, which is no unsubstantial shadow under the sun, but a substantial reality under the sun's creator. That God is helping us to yearn for what the real substance, the real reality, what the shadow is pointing us to. The shadows in this life, the beautiful food and drink and time with friends, the beauty of the sunsets, are just shadows of greater beautiful thing. What can a shadow teach us, right? If you go out this evening and see shadows, a shadow can maybe show you the shape of something. A shadow can show you the size of something. But a shadow can even bring you relief from the sun, but they cannot give you the fullness of the thing that they are reflecting. You can stand in the shadow of a house, but not be in the house. So let us not be content with the shade and the shadows of the things that we have in this world, but yearn for what greater promises they're describing for us. So don't worry, be happy. No, be, don't worry, but be faithful. Don't worry as much, but put our faith and our fear in the one who is restoring and recreating all things the one who has dealt with wickedness, who has brought justice, that mercy and justice meet together at the cross and at this table and at this font of baptism, we encounter that. I, I feel this way often, and this week is no exception. Where I feel as I prepare words for a sermon, how incomplete these words are, how I feel like the things that I've said haven't truly fulfilled or brought about in real convincing ways and in true relief the things and the truths that we're trying to study. I feel like I'm just trying to grasp my arms around a fleeting shadow. But the good news is God doesn't just leave us with Proverbs. God does just, doesn't leave us with half-finished platitudes. I think we as Christians can fall into that trap of thinking, well, just don't worry, trust God, and that's all we need to say. Just those words alone can feel so incomplete. I often feel like a fool trying to wrap my words around the infinite. But I am grateful that even as I struggle to put reality to these words, that God gives us visible words. The table, the baptism, they're visible words, tangible things. We can understand salvation. We can understand justice and mercy. In a few moments, we'll have Sean come up for 